as the viaduct fades into Seattle's past, hear what some are saying about their noisy neighbor. It's going to be sad to not be able to see that anymore. Built before I-5, the viaduct was the first rapid route through town. But how did it come about? It was a 15-year-plus project. After 11 years of this, his view is about to go from so-so to spectacular. These stories and more coming up next on City Street. Hi, I'm Enrique Cerna, and welcome to City Stream on the Alaskan Way Viaduct. Now, by the time this show airs, the highway will be closed forever. So we decided to take one final trip before shutdown. For 65 years, the viaduct was a quick way to skirt downtown. But it's this, the incomparable view, that will be remembered. Some 90,000 vehicles cross the span each day, but its sturdy design was compromised by the 2001 Nisqually earthquake. It was no longer safe. And soon it will be out of sight. For those working in its shadow, opinions vary about their towering gray neighbor. Some say it's an eyesore way past its prime. Others are sad to see it go. We started in April of 1978, so it's been just a little over 40 years that we've been in the same location. I don't feel it until people mention it. When they ask me about the noise, I just say, oh yeah, it does make noise. But I've, I've turned it off so many years ago, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I don't really have a lot that I dislike about it. It's, it's big and gray, but uh, it's really grown on me over the past four years. I have a, a strange attachment to it. I am a little bit concerned about how quiet it's going to be. I'm used to it. My office window is uh, right there, so I can hear everything all day. And like I said, it just kind of becomes a drone after a while. Um, I'm curious because I get, it's hard for me to sleep when I like take trips outside the city. So I don't know if I'll be able to work with all that quiet. <laughs> I love this city. I mean, this is, this city is, in a majestic place, um, whether it's day or night, and the night view is um, is gonna be, I'm gonna miss that a lot, because I love going, especially going that way, towards the stadiums, and I've worked at both, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be sad to not be able to see that anymore. Uh, just taking some pictures, just for fun. Just capture it, just so I can show people in case we forget. It's, um, it's a little bit sad for me. I lived here most of my life, and uh, I just enjoy the viaduct when I drive on it and seeing the wonderful view here. And, um, but I guess that's the way it goes. That's progress. Waterfront's going to change. You know, the rents are going to go through the roof already started to see it. The, the, the business model that I've developed is based on this location, a mix of tourists and locals. 30, there's four, 16. I have people from all over the world, every time they come to Seattle, they stop by. What I'll miss the most is being able to operate my business. Without it, I don't think it's going to happen. These low rent buildings, warehouse buildings are going to disappear. That's what I miss, is the opportunity to continue. One thing I actually really enjoy about it is um, in the mornings, before our hygiene center opens up downstairs, our clients will actually line out here underneath the viaduct to get out of the rain and everything. And they're out of the way of traffic and all that, but they can actually stay dry while they're waiting for the doors to open, and then they can come inside and access services afterwards. I think we're gonna stick around. Um, we're here to serve our clients, and we have no intention of leaving anytime soon. 
ultimately it's going to work out. People are going to find other ways to get through downtown, get to downtown. I think aesthetically it's going to make the city much more attractive. I'll be happy to see it gone from the standpoint is that I would like to see the city connect to the waterfront. The plans to put in some park space and that sort of thing will be very good for the public, I think. I'm hoping it'll bring more people, you know, especially in the summer. I think it'll be beautiful for that, so. I'm hoping it's a bit more open and that people can kind of access. I hear there's going to be a park over here. It'd be nice to be able to kind of walk out there after work and maybe enjoy a sunset. I'm just a little sad. You know, tomorrow's the last day. You know what? I may make my husband drive just so I can get that last bit of, of view. We'll see an icon go away, I think, is, is the bottom line. Viaduct demolition will take about six months, starting with the Columbia Street on-ramp just two blocks from here, and also the area north of Pike Street. Many cities, as a major infrastructure project, created elevated highways. Just ahead, it was a scenic bypass through Seattle for six decades. But how did the viaduct come to be? That's next on City Street. These days, Seattle's rising population and gridlock are nothing new. Nearly a century ago, the city faced the same predicament. Back then, leaders came up with a two-pronged approach to ease traffic. Interstate 5 would cut through downtown, but before that, traffic streamed through Seattle's new Alaskan way. Producer Randy Ng looks back on the viaduct's early years. You know, the viaduct has been in the civic imagination for a long time. Uh, decades before it was actually built, people dreamed of a freeway that would circumvent downtown Seattle. There was so much congestion, particularly on the waterfront. You know, we were a shipping center and the waterfront was busy with shipbuilding, with cargo being transferred. They wanted to get all the traffic out of their backyard, so to speak. They wanted to have free access to the piers and to all the shipping activity that happened downtown. So the viaduct was a way to um, circumvent that. Remember that in the early 20th century, the number of cars on the street was proliferating. We think of traffic jams now. There were traffic jams back then on streets that had not even seen a car a few years before. So somehow building a route that would get through all that, beneath all that, or as it turned out, above all that, was long dreamed of, and that's what led eventually to the viaduct. Uh, originally, the dream was that there would be two, one on the west, which is essentially what the viaduct became, and one on the east, which eventually became I-5. But the viaduct pathway was the cheaper and easier to construct, principally because so much of the right-of-way was already publicly owned. So the viaduct got the attention, it got the money, and uh, they broke ground in 1950. But the interesting thing is they didn't actually complete the viaduct until 1966. It was a 15-year-plus project. Uh, some engineers wanted the freeway to just cut through the city with very few chances to get off in the middle of downtown. 
But think about those downtown merchants and property owners. They didn't want all those cars flying past them. They wanted those cars to end up in downtown and essentially become their customers. So there was a lot of debate about where do we put the on and off ramps in the central part of the city. In fact, the Downtown Seattle Association was formed in part to help mitigate the impacts of the viaduct and to make sure the viaduct was serving downtown as well as the suburbs to the north and south. Many cities, as a major infrastructure project, created elevated highways. There were many cities that wanted to bypass the clutter of what was on the street level. So the West Side Highway in New York, Wacker Drive in Chicago, the Embarcadero in San Francisco, the viaduct fell into that category. There was really design remorse even before it was built. Some of the best architects in the city took strong objection to the notion of this elevated freeway. Uh, they thought the uh, pylons were too thick, they thought the roadway itself was too ungainly, they felt it had absolutely no design amenities that would make it a more compatible part of the visual landscape. So from the very beginning people said, you know, this, this doesn't look right. But the engineers, as often happens in Seattle history, held sway. Uh, they said it may not be beautiful, but it will be functional, it will be utilitarian, and it will be affordable. And that carried the day. Ultimately, 100,000 cars a day would use the viaduct. And this was just in the first couple of years of its use. So from the very beginning, it solved a, a core transportation challenge. A couple of little known facts. Um, as the original designs were being uh, presented to the public, one of Seattle's great architects, Paul Theory, said, you know what you really need to have is a tunnel. So it's interesting that in some ways history is the future going back to where we were decades ago. Another fact that I love to share with people is that our uh, Governor Dan Evans, his very first job as a young engineer was to help design the viaduct. Now another progress report from Mayor Clinton. I thought perhaps you'd be interested in seeing a few of our most recent traffic improvements. The Broad and Mercer Street underpass, the Alaskan Way viaduct extension. The viaduct was really a signal of Seattle's coming of age as a modern American city after the war. You couldn't be a modern city if you had to have all your cars go on surface streets. You had to have that freeway. It let Seattleites know that we were a modern, growing, progressive American city. It will definitely be a passing of an era, but I think where we can take some comfort is that we know that what's coming next is universally believed to be an improvement in terms of how we can reconnect with our central waterfront. One man who knows the viaduct better than most is Ed McNaughton. When he pulls back his curtains, the viaduct is the first thing he sees. How's that? Well, this is Ed's apartment, and just 40 feet away is Ed's soon-to-be quiet neighbor. Ed says he's looking forward to the day his neighbor leaves town. My view? So I like it. It's all right. I got some pot water and then concrete. And then out of every window I see the concrete. Concrete, that's all you see right here. Concrete there, concrete, 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 concrete. <laughs> Live life with the viaduct. It's uh, loud, you know, you can hear it now, but you get used to it after so many years. At first, you couldn't stand it. And then uh, the sirens, cars in the morning, get used to all that. You see the traffic stopping. You see all the wrecks that are down this way because they stopped this way. See, I'm from New York City, too. I just lived with it because it was good to be living here, you know? Four o'clock, five o'clock, there'll be the bumper to bumper, and you see all the people you can wave to. Hey, hey, slow down. <laughs> and if I had a big, long stick, I could probably sell coffee. <laughs> when they close it down, come on, I'm gonna have a killer view. That's for damn sure. Now, if I was on the next floor up, you could just look at that. You see that concrete wall? And if I was down there, they'd get the concrete. But now, without that, you're gonna have the sun from then all the way down. I'll be seeing the whole, sh the whole picture, not a little bit, like three sections of a picture. The sky, the view, and then the street. 
I'll see the whole thing in one. That's gonna be nice. I'm gonna grow tomatoes. <laughs> These are owned by next door, the Compass Center, and I don't think they'll be selling. But I was wondering about if they were gonna turn it into condos or whatever. That's, that's, that's to see. That's, that's gonna come, we'll see what happens. I can't wait. I just want to see the view without it and the life that's going to be around here. It's going to be different. It's going to be quieter. It's going to be cleaner. And then they're going to redo everything down there. It's going to be a park I hear across that way. And the waterfront's starting to look really a lot nicer already. They've improved everything. Now this is the only saw right here. It's going away. Soon. Soon it's going away. I can't wait. The Seattle Housing Authority subsidizes part of Ed's rent. Rent on a place he's lived for nearly 12 years. We'll revisit Ed once the roadway starts coming down to see what life is like. This is another one that it's sad to see go away. Next on City Street, as the Battery Street Tunnel enters its final act, we peer into the hidden world that made everything work. Stream returns from the Pike Place market front and this signature shot of the viaduct. Now before long the Highway 99 tunnel will take its place, but how do you enter and where do you exit and what's the new configuration? WashDOT produced some extremely helpful videos that show you the way. First the approach from the south end. Getting around Seattle after the new SR99 tunnel opens is all about making new choices. The tunnel's exits and entrances are different than the ones in the viaduct. Think of the access points as moving north to Seattle Center and south to the sports stadiums to create a two mile long tunnel underneath downtown. This video shows you what it's like to drive north once the new tunnel opens. 99 northbound heading to downtown stays the same until this new exit near the sports stadiums. The new exit opens a week or so later than the new tunnel. Here you can choose bear left to stay on 99 through the new tunnel or turn right to get to downtown and Alaskan Way. This downtown exit takes you to a new intersection at South Dearborn Street near the tunnel ventilation stacks. Here, buses and cars can turn right to get to downtown streets or go straight to use temporary Alaskan Way along the waterfront. Your destination will drive your choice. If you've chosen to drive through the tunnel, your next decision point comes at the tunnel's north end, near the Space Needle. You can stay on 99 to head to parts north or take the new Mercer Street exit in South Lake Union. Here, your choices are turn left to get to Mercer Street and Interstate 5, turn right on Dexter toward downtown, or go straight for South Lake Union destinations. And now a guide for those approaching the north end of the new Highway 99 tunnel heading southbound. This video shows what driving south into Seattle looks like with the new tunnel. As you approach the Space Needle, you'll have two choices. Stay on southbound 99 for the tunnel, or exit left to Denny Way and downtown. At this exit, there's something new. The first intersection you'll approach will be Harrison Street, which crosses Aurora for the first time in more than 60 years. At Harrison Street, you can turn left to South Lake Union, right to Seattle Center and Queen Anne, or go straight to get to Denny Way and downtown Seattle. Your destination will drive your choice. If you choose to take the tunnel underneath Seattle, your next decision point is two miles away, near the stadiums. 
Bear right to stay on Southbound 99 for West Seattle, SeaTac Airport, and other parts south. Or bear left to take the exit for the sports stadiums, interstates, and ferries. Once you reach the Royal Bromeway intersection, you'll have more choices. Turning left gets you to First Avenue and beyond. If you choose to go straight towards South Atlantic Street, you can turn left to reach I-90 and I-5 or right to get to East Marginal Way in the Port of Seattle. Your destination will drive your choice. But before the new tunnel opens, let's look back at the old one. Just around that corner is the Battery Street Tunnel. And like the viaduct, the tunnel's days are numbered. Felix Bunnell goes underground, revealing the aging technology that kept the Battery Street Tunnel in operation way past its prime. Most people don't even notice it. It's just a small structure made of cinder blocks that sits at the southwest corner of 4th and Battery in Belltown. But to Rick Rada, longtime superintendent for maintenance for the Washington State Department of Transportation, it's a symbol of another era, one that's about to come to an end. I love the old structures. This is another one of them. I love the old 520 bridge. It went away. That was sad. I've you know, watched a lot of upgrades over my career. And um, this is another one that it's sad to see go away. That cinder block building is also the entrance to another world, hidden down an emergency exit staircase and tucked in below the sidewalks of Battery Street. This is a control room in the Battery Street tunnel, uh, built in 1954. The control room is like a tiny little office, and when the sliding door is closed, it's pretty much invisible. Just a few feet away, on the other side of a concrete wall, cars are speeding past unaware in the lanes of northbound 99, like they have since 1954. What you see is 1950s vision. This is a time capsule. Not much at all has changed. There's a few modern um, electronic devices that have been installed. But other than that, all the systems are original, uh, right down to the mercury switches. This controls the fire system for the Battery Street Tunnel. So it's 1950 technology. It's just a, a water system. There's no foam, that sort of thing. If it reads, uh, you know, temperature rises significantly fast, it'll alarm and uh, trigger a dump of the water system. Fire or smoke will do the same thing. So this is, this is just a diagram of the sprinkler system in the zone, which, what systems are where, with the street names, and where to find their, the, the different fans are marked. They've got it all labeled out. Need help from the sprinkler company? Just dial Main 34780. The Battery Street Tunnel was built as part of the construction project that took old Highway 99 off of city surface streets and onto the viaduct to bypass all that downtown traffic. Early designs for Battery Street envisioned a sunken but open road, or what was in those days called a subway. Though the subway name never really caught on, it did stick for a while, as these old photos and newspaper clippings clearly show. And changing the subway to a tunnel meant more than just calling it by a different name. Engineers had to design ventilation to get rid of vehicle exhaust and a sprinkler system in case of fire. In July 1954, before the tunnel was open to traffic, they tested both systems to make sure the now enclosed roadway was safe for cars and their occupants. Six decades later, with only minor upgrades, those systems are still doing their job, even as the Battery Street Tunnel is about to be bypassed by the new Highway 99 and Deep Bore Tunnel. Instead of spending money knowing that this was going to be decommissioned eventually, we have took a, a little bit of that money. I've just been maintaining the system as is for the last, what, five to seven years. The technicians have done a great job, uh, an excellent job of keeping these old systems uh, together and then finding the parts and pieces that they need to keep it going. I tip my hat to them. They've done an excellent job. While the technicians notice when the safety systems need maintenance, what about all those Battery Street Tunnel drivers? Do they ever notice the control room? Yeah, I, I don't think many people do. I, you know, you drive through and you're paying attention to the cars in front of you and that's about it. In addition to maintaining the vintage safety systems, WashDOT inspects the tunnel twice a year and gives the walls a good scrub, which is also done for safety. The walls are white to help for visibility and reflection so you can see breaking lights ahead of you. This tunnel is on a curve, so when you see breaking lights and reflecting off of the wall, it helps you warn you. So you do try to keep it clean, 
We try to have it cleaned uh, every six months and wash the walls, but the cars going by do keep it pretty filthy awfully quick. We have a, a large machine with a spiral brush on it. We call it Mr. Bubbles. We try to get it out here. It, we, we run a flusher truck by the first, soaks down the wall, and then we bring the truck back by with its automated arm on it, the person controlling it, and it scrubs the, the tunnel. But safety in the Battery Street Tunnel isn't only about old-fashioned things like soap and water. Some of the traffic mine is new. We do have gates, you know, on either end of it that were installed. So if we do have a problem in the tunnel, the signage goes up and the gates come down to stop traffic from entering. So there's a couple new things, but for the most part, this is all original. What also appears to be all original is the old desk in the corner and even a remarkably intact vintage bathroom. Did this 1954 control room actually once serve as someone's office? There may have been somebody in the very beginning that worked here, that monitored, that, that saw an alarm and, and manually did that. If there ever was a somebody who sat at that desk, he's been retired for a long time. And now Rick Rada is retiring too. In fact, just a few days after we filmed this interview. Oh, it is sentimental, but I, you know, I've been looking at a lot of things now. And so over the last you know, 34 years, I, I've watched all the upgrades. I think, I think the upgrades are nice, they're needed for safety and efficiency and all that. But it is sad to see some of these old structures go away. And the folks at WashDOT are sad to see Rick Rada go away too. Many people lobbied to keep the tunnel open, suggesting a variety of new uses. That all ended when they learned that it would cost millions to pay for necessary safety repairs. So the tunnel will be packed with debris from the viaduct demolition, then filled the rest of the way with concrete. That wraps up this episode of City Stream from the Alaskan Way Viaduct. For more on all the changes related to Highway 99 and the resulting traffic impact known as the Seattle Squeeze, we have several websites to share from the city and the state. They are seattletraffic.org and washdot.wa.gov. We leave you with the Viaduct's final moments. Thousands of people streamed onto the roadway determined to take one last ride. Cerna. Thank you for watching.